Welcome to AEW Unrestricted, the official podcast of All Elite Wrestling. I am referee and co-host Aubrey Edwards, along with my co-host and commentary legend, Tony mm. Schiavone. How you doing, Tony? Aubrey, what's up, girl? How you been? I'm good. I'm two cups of coffee in. How many monsters are you in? I'm one monster in. I got another one on the way. On the way. Sweet. Yeah, I don't, I don't do the coffee stuff anymore, even though it's been 18 months working at Starbucks. That that did not uh, get me out of coffee. I just gone in, gone a different direction. That's all. Have a have a new love. I respect it. It's fine. Uh, also, something I respect is people needing to reschedule podcasts because they have a birth of a child. So <laughs> I'm excited to finally have Kyle O'Reilly on the podcast today. Uh, that was that was a fun message. Getting like 10 minutes before our last podcast, like, "Hi, uh, Kyle's not going to make it. His wife went into labor. So congratulations. How are you? Thank new you dad? so much." It's so cool. Um, yeah, I, I, you hear the cliche. It's such an indescribable feeling. Oh, you won't know love until you have a kid. All right, I got gotcha. you. But then when it happens, it's really a, it's, it's pretty special. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, I want to touch on something I mentioned on Twitter. I called you a Pacific Northwest legend. Yeah. Uh, and I think that was kind of like amongst like my circle. Because uh, yeah. I started working in Vancouver after you had already been signed. And like, I've just heard stories about Kyle O'Reilly and El Phantasmo like all the time from like mm -hmm. Baroni and Nicole and Artie and all these people. So I'm like, oh, this guy's like legendary. He's awesome. <laughs> so I was like, yeah. oh, right. So anytime someone thinks Pacific Northwest legend, they think like Brian Danielson. I'm like, oh, right. I got to right. tailor it down a little bit. So you're yeah. a legend to me. Thank you for being here today. Well, I appreciate uh, being legendary status to you, Aubrey. That's that's pretty cool. But uh, <laughs> it just it doesn't feel that way. But yeah. Nah, take it, take it. Uh, so you debuted at the Dynamite uh, Holiday Bash, came in in the middle of a match. Uh, I think Bryce's back was turned, so this may be news to him. But uh, came in, uh, confronted Orange Cassidy. Uh, what was all that like? Like, how was that day for you? It was super cool. And, you know, I want to say stressful, but it really wasn't. It was just kind of like, just exciting. Um, like a lot of my experiences in the last few years of, of wrestling have been very stressful and high pressure situations, but this just felt like, I don't know, it was like a homecoming. It, it, I just felt comfortable and ready to rock. And uh, I didn't really confirm anything, I think, until like the day before or maybe the Monday before that Wednesday. And uh, yeah, and, you know, they flew me into, I think we were in uh, Greensboro and I flew into Charlotte and... Um, Boz, the driver, picked me up and we had a great chat on uh, the way out to Greensboro. And it was just such a cool, exciting time. And uh, of course, you know, seeing everybody backstage, people that I came up with in this business for years that I hadn't seen in so long, it was just a really cool reunion of sorts. And then, of course, you know, the debut happens in this arena full of people. And it just was so exciting. And like, I'm kind of getting goosebumps just thinking about it and reminiscing about it. But, uh, it was a special moment, and I'm so grateful to have had that opportunity with AEW. Uh, the, the moment uh, Kyle received a, a tremendous pop uh, when, when you arrived, and, and I think you know, realistically there's a lot of fans out there that expected you to arrive with AEW, but they didn't know when, and they didn't know how it would unfold. And It was such a tremendous pop when you got into the ring. Was it diff And you did a great job of just you know looking the badass that you are. Uh, was it tough doing that? I mean, is it tough to stay in character sometime when you get such a tremendous pop? I mean, you're going to be a heel, but fans love to see you, right? Right, right. In those situations, you just want to kind of embrace it and just enjoy that love that you're feeling from uh, enjoy and pick up on that energy. But that's kind of the cool thing about wrestling. You can still enjoy that energy and pick up on the crowd response, but still stay true to your yourself and your character. And I right. think that was cool. And I think the people were just excited to see me and Adam and Bobby all together. It was like, it wasn't right. just, Oh, there's Kyle O'Reilly. Yeah. But it's, Oh, there's Kyle O'Reilly. And the three of those dudes are together. Whoa. Sure, right. Like I, that was, that's what made it kind of cool. I think. Right. I think that's one of the things that I really like about AEW in particular is that we don't shy away from, people's past experiences yes. where they are like maybe we can't say what we can't say sure. undisputed on tv and we can't you know mention wwe but like our fans at least know like the importance you of you to showing up. that right yeah right yeah. it's like it's not like oh yeah he vanished for four years and wasn't exactly wrestling. it's like <laughs> yeah. no they that's know. part they of know. the great storyline here 
Right. And if you just ignore it, then the people are just like, okay, like we're not idiots. Come on. Just acknowledge this. Like, I, yeah, totally agree with you. Right. There. I like uh, I like it in particular because it feels like a very adult storyline where like Adam Cole has these two groups of friends and they're both yeah. like vying for his time. And I'm like, oh, that's like every adult ever who's like changed jobs or <laughs> totally <laughs> like yeah, this is a group of friends. Relatable. Changes, you, yeah. You want to keep that link to your past of your buddies from before, but you're kind of moving on. Like, yeah, it's very, uh, very adult. Yes. Uh, Dynamite New Year smash. Uh, you. um. Adam Cole, Bobby Fish versus Orange Cassidy and the Best Friends. How did it feel to get the pin on your first debut on Dynamite? But also, I think it was the last pin on the Dynamite and TNT era. What does that wow. feel like yeah. to you? It was unreal. Um, just just coming out in that Jacksonville arena, which, you know, during the pandemic, I, you know, of course, watching AEW and, and watching that environment and, and seeing that arena. And then it's kind of surreal to actually come out and to... to hear a crowd response and to have a, a whole crowd of people there actually enjoying <laughs> what they're seeing was, was kind of special <laughs> in of itself. And of course, wrestling with those guys and having a six man tag against the best friends. Like these are dudes that I've known for a long time. And so it was, it was pretty cool and unique to have my debut with those guys as well. Like it was very, like I was very comfortable in every aspect of it. And um, yeah, it was, it was, really exciting and i i am just can't wait to get back in there i can't wait to be on tbs i can't wait to, to be on tnt again i just can't wait to come back and uh get back in the ring we are talking with kyle o'reilly and kyle coming up a little bit later we're gonna have fan questions but since we're talking about adam cole and bobby fish and your association with them this comes from at wiggles ft on uh, twitter wants to know how did you meet adam cole and how did the guys come together as a team and to develop into a story that spans for years. How did that all start? Yeah, uh, meeting Adam Cole goes back to 2009. And I had recently just packed up everything I own and left British Columbia and crossed the border into the US. And I was going to make this pro wrestling thing work no matter what. And it, whatever it takes, I'm just going to move my whole life and starve, sleep on a couch until whatever it works out. And so, um, there was a company called Dragon Gate USA that was uh, starting to gain some momentum in the independence. And they had a show in Philadelphia. And so I, I drove, I, there was an opportunity for a pre-show match or a dark match. Maybe if you, if, you know, if you come out, maybe there's something, a spot for you. So of course I get That's my car. It's, it's, it's a long drive. Um, but yeah. And so I drove to Philly and I uh, get to the building and there's this young kid named Adam Cole who's, pretty fresh like i think he'd only been wrestling maybe a year or two i, I mean i was a veteran of four years at that point <laughs> but uh no we were still super green and super new and super just anxious and ready to prove ourselves and so we we wrestled each other in a dark match and it it we did really well like the crowd was super into it it was like our first sort of breakout match that like people are talking about us now. And so they went up on the YouTube and it just created a bit of buzz for both of us. And um, it was, it was really cool to see. And uh, we, we hit it off like gangbusters from the first time, you know, hanging out and talking and working together. And we had great chemistry and, um, and then we ended up getting picked up by ring of honor and they, they ended up signing us both at the same time. And they're like, well, what are we going to do with these two young kids? Let's just put them in a, a tag team as baby faces to try and start getting over. And, and that's exactly what we did. We, we started tagging and then, you know, I think uh, eventually I turned on him or however that all went down and then we feuded and we've been like connected ever since like our careers are kind of paralleled and we've been tagging, we've been bitter enemies, blood feuds best friends again and then enemy it's like it's just been kind of a a cycle and it's it's been amazing because i owe so much to that guy like i don't want to say that i've been riding his coattails because that's not necessarily true but He's like I yours. Owe... <laughs> <laughs> but it's just it's such like um i owe so much to just being associated with adam and uh, i've learned so much as a performer from him and yeah, he's, he's one of my legit best friends and just a great guy and, you know, and one of the best all around performers in this business. So it's yeah. it's pretty cool that, you know, that's a bonus as well. 
So when we had Adam on the podcast, he said that the the journey to AEW happened rather quickly. His contract expired, and then he suddenly shows up uh, pretty soon after that. Um, and I remember the day in Greensboro. Anytime we have someone new joining the company, there's always that like kayfabe moment of like they have their own dressing room, and it just says special guest. And I look oh. across the hall, and you're sitting in there with the elite. I'm like, oh, okay, no, it's definitely Kyle. No one's keeping this kayfabe. Like, everyone just yeah. knows he's here. This yeah. is great. Um, so when did you seriously consider, like, coming over to AEW? Like, when did that become an option for you? I mean, probably as soon as Bobby uh, debuted in AEW. And then, of course, once Adam debuted in AEW, you know, the wheels start turning. And it's like, okay, well what do I got to do to get there as well? You know, these are, these are my guys. And this is a, this is a place where I think Kyle O'Reilly can really, you know, be utilized well and, and fit in well. Like this is a, a, a company that has really set the standard for an in-ring product. And I'm just, I think I'm suited better in the environment like AEW and it, it really felt like homecoming there. And it's, I'm just excited at all the prospects, all the potential matchups and just everything about AEW was like, man, what do we got to do to get, to get there? And so it was kind of like the, you know, in motion, the second, all those guys came over and once my deal came up, it was kind of a no brainer really. Uh, do you remember uh, what it was like when you first met Tony Khan and talking to him? Oh, it was, it was pretty cool and surreal. <laughs> Uh, it always it was, is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We were chatting, um, I think the week when all the stuff with the Jacksonville Jaguars coach was going down. Right. And so he was so busy doing <laughs> yep. a million different things. I have no idea where this guy finds the time to even take a, a phone no call with a guy like a Kyle O'Reilly, like where right. I, don't, I don't, it blows my mind. Uh, but you can tell just from talking with him that like, he is so passionate about this industry and about this business and about making AEW what it is. Like, look what he's done with AEW in two years. It's absolutely incredible. Not to mention what he's doing, you know, with uh, Fulham and with the Jags. It's like, it's, it's pretty cool. And um, you really feel his energy and can tell that he's, when he looks you in the eye and he gives you the time of day to chat, like he's not just, it's legit. Like he's, it's, he's really concerned about you and he wants whatever you questions you have, he wants to answer them to the fullest extent of his abilities and just to he's just a good boss man he, and he it's it's really cool i don't i can't say enough good things about tony really there's a there's that moment where like he looks at you in the eye and just says let's fucking go and you're like no one has yes. ever meant more yeah. about that phrase than him <laughs> and it's it like truly no he, fires he legit you up. means it yeah it does it, it does fire you up absolutely totally it does. does yeah we're talking with kyle o'reilly and he had a, a tremendous uh career uh, before his time in AEW, we'll talk more about that when we continue on AEW Unrestricted. So you guys know we travel every single week for AEW Dynamite and Rampage, and that means we're constantly using unsecure uh, airport Wi-Fi, hotel Wi-Fi, arena Wi-Fi, and security is super, super important. I'm not worried about hackers stealing my data because I use NordVPN on my phone, my laptop, every single device, and it gives me huge peace of mind. Yeah, l l let me tell you this, and most of you know this, but this is very important because it's true. They're everywhere. They're hacker. If you go on to a public internet, it's really cool. You go into the airport, go into Starbucks, go into a restaurant, and they say, hey, free Wi-Fi. There's somebody around looking to hack into your information. But with NordVPN, that's not going to happen, right, Aubrey? That's right. My internet traffic is routed through secure encrypted channels, which hey. protects my data, my privacy. I can use NordVPN up on six devices. I can use it up to six devices. So everything is protected, not just, not just my laptop, but my phone, everything else. Absolutely. So, uh, Aubrey, and I know you are in charge of gaming with AEW, and I know that's a very, very big deal, having a VPN to protect everything. I stream and download movies all the time when I travel, so that's a big deal for me. So we want to invite you to go to NordVPN.com slash AW or use code AW to get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan plus an additional month for free. It's equivalent to buying a cup of coffee every month. That's right. That's all it is. 
a small price to pay for premium cyber security access to vast amounts of entertaining content. 30-day money-back guarantee if NordVPN is not for use, there's absolutely no risk. Sign up today at nordvpn.com slash aw, use code aw to get a huge discount of NordVPN plus an initial month for free. Give us that website again, Aubrey. That is nordvpn.com slash aew. Totally risk-free. Check it out. You won't regret it. AEW Unrestricted continues with Tony and Aubrey. Glad you could be with us and so glad that Kyle O'Reilly is with us. Kyle's, uh, just a little story, Kyle's, uh, when he arrived, it was kind of like uh, like when Miro arrived with me. I was backstage in Jacksonville and Miro walks by. He said, hi, I'm Miro. And hi, how you doing? And then I stopped and went, shit, Miro's here. So I walk <laughs> into, so we're, we're uh, we're in Greensboro, and I go into the Bucks uh, dressing room. I always like to go in to give people shit. And I go into the dressing room, and, and Kyle said, hey, Kyle O'Reilly. I went, hey, how you doing? And I walk out and went, shit, Kyle O'Reilly's here. It's just like <laughs> it's one of those senior moments where you it doesn't hit you at first, but there you go. But anyway, it's great having you here, Kyle. And uh, you grew up in Canada playing rugby uh, sure. all the way through high school. And listen, I had a son who played rugby, which – in Georgia is not probably what it is in Canada, but I know what you kids go through playing rugby. That uh, what did you love most about rugby? That man, that's that's a that's a badass sport. It really it, is. It's a great sport, and one of my favorite things about it is just the team camaraderie. It's like you you again you face another team, and it's like just a battle. It's a war, and then the second the match is over, it's hugging the other team let's go for beers and it's just really like a right. cool really cool uh sort of club and fraternity to be a part of if you're a rugby player and um it's just it's a really amazing sport it's, it's shocking that it's not a bigger sport in the u.s because it's really got everything it's it's physical yeah. it's intense it's hard hitting and it's technical and these guys like there's no whistles and breaks like it's con- it's like a like a soccer match it's constantly going without any stoppage and like you have to be insane physical, uh, can condi- have crazy conditioning to, to be a good rugby player. And, uh, yeah, growing up in Canada, it was kind of big, like in high school, like it was pretty big kind of sport to be a part of. Right. Um, and then we, in my senior year, we got to go over to Europe and play in Ireland and, and in England and Wales and just get absolutely smashed by those guys because it's a different league over there. Like they grow up playing like it'd be like them coming to Canada and playing hockey against us. Right. Like they're just right. going to get absolutely destroyed. Oh right. yeah. Uh, but, but that experience made us like such a, a, a complete team. Like we learned so much from it and we came back and then ended up going undefeated in our senior year after getting just slaughtered by these guys. So it's, and we gained so much from them and just stayed in touch with those guys and their coaches and their teams. And yeah, it was, it's a pretty, pretty unique uh, sport. <laughs> So you, you broke into wrestling in 2005 and started your MMA training about a year after that. Uh, why did you start the MMA training after wrestling? Because I know everyone kind of has their own own reasonings and whatnot. Yeah, it was just kind of a, a way to supplement my training that was similar um, to pro wrestling. Like, it's really hard to capture what it feels like to perform in the ring uh, from a cardio standpoint. Like, there's really nothing that compares to a, a pro wrestling match. I felt like jujitsu and kickboxing was, was close to that. And it was something that like made me a better pro wrestler. It made my footwork better. It made my timing better. It made all my strikes and my submission transitions better. Like I, I watched when I first broke in or debuted or whatever. And, you know, I'm trying to do like an arm bar and stuff like that. It just looks off because I didn't actually train yet. And so it wasn't until like years and years of training that it actually started to, to, translate better into my pro wrestling so now it's just it's part of my lifestyle i love it so much it's something that i do you know on the regular specifically jujitsu it's i love it and it just made me a bit more complete performer uh all around and it was you know it's difficult at first like especially you know those first few years nothing's really fun until you're good at it so when you're just going in and getting smashed repeatedly by like tiny little dudes it's you know (laughs) it it it, uh kind of 
bruises the ego a little bit, but once you stick <laughs> with it and you get better at it, like it's, it's something that I absolutely love now. And it, I wouldn't change anything about that journey. And it's just really made my pro wrestling so much better. Just having that ability. I think. You mentioned that you met, uh, Adam Cole in 2009, and that began Ring of Honor when you were in Ring of Honor, and you said you grew up wanting to be in Ring of Honor. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I might, well, my main goal in, in wrestling, I wanted to wrestle in Japan, and okay. I felt like going through Ring of Honor was like my my pathway there. Um, at the time, I broke in in 2005, and uh, that's when Ring of Honor was like the the number one indie company that's when brian danielson was having that amazing roh world title run right and i just wanted to be a part of that because you know it seemed like you could make a bit of a living there as an independent wrestler like i had no like the possibility of going to wwe or a major company was didn't even consider that a possibility and it's nothing it, i didn't really want that i wanted to go to japan and i wanted to to make those sacrifices and to, to have that journey that made it worthwhile. If, if I did make it in wrestling, I, you wanted it to be full of sacrifices. We all read the autobiographies, like the Mick Foley book of sleeping in his car, eating raw potatoes. Like what's the point of making it in this business without having an autobiography that's worth reading. And so, uh, you know, I had to make that happen. And then, like I was saying before, in, in 09, I packed up my life into my little Cavalier and, and drove to St. Louis and, you know, lived, did the illegal alien thing for a few years and just determined to make it work no matter what. And uh, I think you kind of have to have that outlook and to make it in wrestling. Like, it's good to have a plan B and everything like that. But I feel like if I did have a plan B or something to fall back on, maybe I wouldn't have taken it as far as I have. Speaking of big indie companies, you had a very good run at PWG. It has quite the, the history and the legacy with a lot of the people at our, our current company. Um, you debuted there 2011, I think, with uh, Adam Cole's Future Shock. Uh, had great feud with the Young Bucks. I remember one of like my favorite matches to watch was the ladder match. Like Knox eventually ends up diving. Yeah. You guys, it's with um, uh, Player One and Player Dose or Player Uno, Player Dose, who are now yeah. you know Evil Uno and Stu Grayson. Uh, talk about your PWG experience and sort of your rise since you were there for so long. It's another place that. You know, as an indie performer, you want to take it to the next level. You get booked on a PWG show, and that's huge exposure because there's such a cult following. And this is the first time I wrestled in Cal well, maybe not the very first time in California, but in, in Los Angeles. And that rabid Reseda crowd is just known for being just like kind of a mecca of indie wrestling. And coming in with Adam and to fight the Young Bucks was like, what a debut to have there. So you can't not kill it with the Young Bucks. Uh, <laughs> you can't do that. So we tore it up and uh, basically had a job there moving forward after that and was always, always looked forward to going to work for PWG. Um, those, those weekends would take it out of you physically just because you, you fly to the West Coast, you go to the venue, the shows start so late. Like sometimes the show wouldn't start till 9, 10 p.m., you're going on at like midnight, which is 3 a.m. on the East Coast. You're so haggard. You get back to the hotel, flights in an hour, back to the airport. Like those weekends would would destroy you, but were so worth it. Like it just, I uh, nothing but fond memories from going to PWG because I really put a lot of passion and energy into those matches there. I'm really proud of the matches that I had there and the run that I had there. And uh, it's a, it was a really special place. Kyle, you mentioned you you really wanted to, your goal was to wrestle in Japan. So in 2014, New Japan Pro Wrestling, you had a run there. And so now you're wrestling, you're at Wrestle Kingdom in front of 60,000 fans at the Tokyo Dome. That had to be uh, quite a moment for you. Absolutely surreal. Absolutely surreal. And um, I think the first Tokyo Dome we did was maybe Wrestle Kingdom 9, I think maybe in 2015. Okay. And and they brought Jim Ross in to do commentary, the English commentary. Right. So that was my first time meeting Jim Ross and having him call one of my matches. And that was one of the things that I could I told my parents, like, you know, okay, you're wrestling with Tokyo Dome, Japan, whatever. That didn't really mean nothing to them. But I told them, Jim Ross is doing commentary on my match. Like, Jim Ross, the, the the commentator from WWF? Like, yeah, like 
it just was so cool to, right. to explain that to them. And I think they were like, okay, maybe this is taking off. Maybe this is kind of a big deal. Uh, right. So I kind of helped explain to them, you know, that this is a, an upward trajectory. It's not just, you know, I'm not just treading water here. Right. Uh, there, you had some incredible matches and moments you're, during your time at NXT. And I know everyone talks about learning some great things from Shawn Michaels and whatnot. Uh, and I want to, I want to ask, like, is there anything in particular you learned during your experience there? And are there any like major moments that stand out to you? I learned a lot about structuring like a main event match. And, you know, there's that age old adage of pro wrestling, listen to the people, listen to the people and never really got what that really meant. Okay. I'm listening to them. Like they're cheering and then they're quieting down. They're cheering. Sean really, kind of taught us just to instead of going up and down with the crowd reaction you try and just keep it like a level like so like on a double down just don't move in like until they start to die and then you can move mm -hmm. and then you bring them back up and it's just little things like that that you don't really think of and you can, it's really hard to just learn on your own until someone just kind of explains that to you and then a light bulb goes off and just helps you take your game to the next level i i feel like my time there made me so much more polished and complete as a performer. Um, I'm so grateful for my time there, the four and a half years there in that system, working with the Shawn Michaelses and, and the William Regals and the Triple H's, like really made me a, a much more polished and confident performer, I think. You had to feel that your, your career was on the right trajectory because you had been in New Japan pro wrestling. You've been on the Indies, New Japan now wrestling the wrestle kingdom big crowd and now you're in nxt and you're going to be seen on a national level so that had to be a good feeling for you signing with them absolutely um it feels like all the sacrifices that i've made the last at that point maybe it was 13 or 14 years were all absolutely worth it i can tell people sure. now you know i've made it to the top company at the time you know i right. made it to a major television show like it's it's just something that you can just point at and say, look, it, all this was so worth it. And I don't know, it's just, it was really cool and really surreal. And um, I'm gr just grateful for having had that opportunity to go there. And because going there, I was able to use that to come to an AEW now where I feel like things are really going to kick off now for Kyle O'Reilly. Yeah. Makes that uh, secret alien illegal move all worth it, doesn't it? So worth it. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. We're talking to Kyle O'Reilly on AEW Unrestricted, and we've got lots and lots of fan questions coming up. You're listening to AEW Unrestricted, the official podcast of All Elite Wrestling. Aubrey and Tony here with the wonderful and amazing Kyle O'Reilly. We've got a bunch of fan questions. Obviously, you've had an incredible run on the indies, a credible run at uh, NXT, and people just want to know more about you and absolutely love you. So... First uh, question from Darren Report. Uh, is there a particular event or match that inspired you to become a wrestler? Ooh. I mean, I feel like the very first time I went to a show, I remember the feel. Like, so it was in 1998, WWF ran a pay-per-view in Vancouver called Rock Bottom. The main event was Stone Cold versus The Undertaker in a Buried Alive match. And like 12-year-old me was just obsessed fan at that point right and i just remember everything about getting to that arena i remember the smell of the t-shirt i remember walking and seeing the ring for the first time and looking around and seeing this huge arena and i the feeling that, that gave me it was just indescribable and it was like <laughs> i know it's cliche to say i at that moment i knew i was going to be a professional wrestler but it really kind of was <laughs> and uh, like every little thing that you know as a kid, you grow up and you have different goals and dreams and hopes and aspirations, but wrestling was always there as something that, and I, I don't care if I never would have made a dime off wrestling. Like if I was still at the Russian cultural center in Vancouver once yeah. a month, I would, I would be doing it with all of my passion that I could muster because it's just something that's in my blood that I just love and I can't describe how much it means to me. So yeah, I just, yeah, from that moment, I think I knew something in the in the in the realm of pro wrestling was for me. Shout out to the RCC, love that love that venue. Yeah, so. great venue. 
Well, shout out to the whole city. One of the great cities in America, in the world. Oh, I appreciate Denver. that, Tony. Great city. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Can't wait till AEW can come there. I, uh, me too. Oh, I can't wait. Spent yeah. a lot, I, sp- I spent a lot of time in uh, Vancouver and Burnaby. Uh, oh, right doing, on. Yeah. Doing voiceovers for EA sports wrestling yeah. back in the nineties. Yep. Yeah. It was tremendous. I had such a great time there. Just a wonderful city. Okay. Ten Chi Jin Hart wants to know. Over the years, Kyle has had a lengthy run as both a singles and a tag team wrestler. What do you prefer? That's a tough one because I absolutely adore tag team wrestling. I think a good tag team match is one of the best things in this business. You know, when it's done well with two teams that have the same philosophies and the same beliefs of, of you know, just psychology and just the way they want to. Uh, present the match like there's there's it's hard to top a good tag match and I, and i've had a lot of amazing tag team partners over the years um but of course you know i love singles wrestling as well i mean it's it, there's there's something so different and unique about each um element and i just i just love to perform in general any chance i get if it's a six man an eight man a straight up tag match or a singles match this is an opportunity for kyle o'reilly to show the world what he's all about and his beliefs and philosophy in wrestling. And I just want to make it as good and as realistic and believable and, and hard hitting as possible as I possibly can. Tony, I'm going to jump down a little bit. we got a question from notorious B I Z. Please ask about cool. Kyle, the clothes, the goofy walk, everything. How much was his, how much came from the office? Um, they really were cool with just kind of, letting us sort of come up with whatever we wanted to do. I felt like, so first I never called myself cool Kyle once. That's what people bestowed upon me. Right. Uh, But it didn't catch on. And you know, that's who knows. um, Maybe it just wasn't as authentic as people wanted to, to get behind it for. And I don't know. It's, it's kind of weird. Um, Who knows if we were, not stuck in one venue every single week with the same fans. Maybe it would have taken off a little more. It's hard when you're, you've turned baby face and you're trying to get over, but your heel is Adam Cole because the people just love the guy. And, and uh, it was kind of difficult for me to, um, you know, sort of turn them in my favor as well. And, uh, and then lo and behold, of course, the whole rebrand happened, the NXT 2.0 thing. And then, uh, all right, like, let's just try something different. And uh, that's the thing about wrestling. You throw stuff at the wall and sometimes stuff sticks, sometimes it doesn't. Absolutely. And you just you just have to put yourself out there and, and whatever you're doing, if it's given to you or if it's your own idea, you just got to try your best. And that's all I've ever wanted to do in wrestling is just try my best. We're talking with Kyle O'Reilly here on AEW Unrestricted and we're doing fan questions. And by the way, we appreciate all the fan questions that were submitted. Uh, to Kyle on Twitter. Uh, This comes from Jedi Marcus. Uh, Kyle, we talked about uh, already about your first time in in AEW. You were in Greensboro. What was your first impression of the locker room in AEW when you first came in that week? There's a a true camaraderie there. And a lot of these, so a lot of these guys I came up in the business with, like I'd mentioned earlier, there was so many people I hadn't seen in years that are some of my really close friends in this industry and there's there really is something in the air in aw in the locker room there's just a real a drive and a passion that is it feels like kind of feels like uh in Reseda in the pwg locker room there's this everyone wants to go out and absolutely kill it and and it it's like a friendly competition like the match before me going out and absolutely killing it it's going to drive me to to kill it in my match which is going to elevate the next match and just it kind of is just it keeps going up in a trajectory that is just i think why AEW is doing so well because it, you can tell from watching the screen that these guys and girls are passionate and they're driven to just just absolutely kill it and uh you can't you can't force that or fake that because you know it's it's when you watch AEW, it's real you see that these people are giving everything they have, uh, you know, from the production to the referees, to the tag match, to the main event. It's there's something about it that is really unparalleled, I think, in this industry, and it's 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 cool to see. And definitely, like everyone feels it. We feel it in the back. They feel it yeah. in the crowd. Like it's just it's a completely exactly. unique experience, but it definitely like captures like what wrestling is. 
I love it. I love it. Uh, we have a question from J Rocket One Twenty One. Is there a story behind playing the air guitar on the championship belt? You know, uh, as a kid, you see the Hogan's coming out playing it. It's just something that right. I came. We had a really cool theme song, uh, and I didn't plan on doing that. I just came out and I was just, just kind of just turned into a psychedelic funky priest slapping the bass on his <laughs> title belt, and just kind of the music took over, and I just kind of. And it turned into a thing of itself. And then people were like, oh, you got to do the guitar thing tonight. Like, what guitar thing? You know, on the belt. Oh, okay. And then it just kind of, I just kind of kept doing it. And I guess people liked it for whatever reason. I think it looks stupid as hell when I do it. But hey, <laughs> if people like it, then all right. <laughs> well, once again, you got to throw things against the wall, see if they stick, yeah, right? And totally. I, that, that stuck. So there you go. So yeah. uh, uh, Endure to Survive wants to know what's your favorite moment with the Undisputed Era? Ooh, favorite moment. I think um, when the group was completed, when Roderick Strong uh, joined the group, Bobby had a bad knee. Um, he was out for one of our big takeover events. And um, we needed another guy to just complete the package. And when the group first started, we were like, there can't be anyone else a part of this thing. But we all sort of agreed that if there had to be another guy, I think Roddy would fit in tremendously because we are tight with him. He, he came up in this business with us and we're all, you know, legitimately close friends. And he brings something to the group that we desperately needed. And, and then lo and behold, the, uh, we get approached, let's, let's think about adding Roddy to the group and we're like, perfect. And, uh, so once, once the uh, group is complete and there was four members, I, that's such a special moment. And, uh, it was really cool. Got a question from uh, uh, Ryan Coates. I particularly, I was very happy about this as well. How happy are you to have Dance Away by Damn Valentine's back as your entrance theme? I know. I love that tune. Uh, yeah, we had that all throughout Ring of Honor and in New Japan. And it's it's another thing. It's weird. Like, same with the, the Undisputed theme song. At first, when you hear it, you're like, uh, you're not thrilled about it. And with Damn Valentine's, it's like, it's kind of cool. He sort of sounds like Danzig when he's singing, and so I can get behind this. And then, the more you use it, the more it 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 uh, jives with you, and the more the crowd, oh yeah, this is the part where we say yeah, you know, <laughs> they get they get uh, <laughs> interested in it and involved or whatever. And it ended up suiting us. And uh, now I can't imagine ever coming out with Bobby to to another uh, song. This is from at Ryan Horton. As someone training in Vancouver, Ryan says that we've got a very rich history of indie wrestling that no one knows about. What are your favorite matches you've seen or been a part of in Vancouver? Ooh. BC. Let's see. That's a tough one. Uh, so, Ryan Danielson used to come up there quite a bit. Yep. And a guy that trained me, uh, his name is Aaron Idol. Just a tremendous uh, wrestler. Um, he's he's a psychologist now. He's not really involved in wrestling anymore, but I'm still very close friends with him. But he, and and believe it or not, he's actually legally blind. And when he's wrestling, he really can't see anything. Uh, like when he's hitting the ropes, they disappear. And he's been a part of some of the best matches I've ever seen. And he had a match with Brian Danielson in uh, Bridgeview Hall in Surrey that was one of the best matches I've ever seen to this day. And, uh, yeah, watching his matches and Aaron Idol versus, um, white tiger or ma is a match that I, as a fan going to independent shows made me want, believe that maybe I could do this. And mm -hmm. there is a pathway to make it in pro wrestling. Cause you know, when you're going, when you just see wrestling on TV, you don't think that there's a, a, an avenue to enter the business from, and then you figure out, Oh, there's independent wrestling shows. There's a, a show with the local, uh, community center. What the hell? And then it kind of just opens. Oh, wow, that, this is something that you can do? Okay. And then uh, when I began to train, I started training under Idol. And uh, yeah, he really explained wrestling is just in such a different way to me. And uh, me and my friend, uh, Sid Silem, we were like, let's just get, let's just go train and we can train under this guy. And uh, yeah. I think, I think it's Sid, great I that- I Sid forever. I, I think it's mm -hmm. great that there's someone who was in wrestling is now into psychology. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we need we need, we need more, more psychs and wrestling. Yeah, yeah. damn right, we do. Oh. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Kyle, thanks a lot, buddy. 
It's great hey, having you with you, us. It's great having you with us. It really is, man. And I, I, uh, I, I saw in back where Arn Anderson one time called you and Bobby Shooters. Uh, he said, "Hey, Shooters." So that's yeah. what I call you and Bobby when I see you guys now, because <laughs> right on. Yeah, because you're pretty freaking stiff. I'm sorry, <laughs> but that in a good way. I mean that in a good way. Okay. Yeah, well, Bobby it. Stiffy Ray Vaughn. I go by Stiffy Wonder. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right. Uh, you can uh, follow Kyle on Instagram and Twitter at K O R Combat. That's K O R Combat. And don't forget, this podcast is available to you wherever you get your podcasts for free. And on YouTube, watch the video version by searching AEW Unrestricted Aubrey Edwards. And then also on YouTube, you can watch Dark Elevation on Mondays and Dark on Tuesdays. Lots of awesome, incredible AEW talent. Uh, speaking of AEW incredible talent, like we're on every friggin' network on the Warner Media branch, it feels like. Uh, we're on TBS on Wednesdays, 8 o'clock, 7 central. And then we're still on TNT, Rampage, Friday, 10 o'clock, uh, 9 central. This is Aubrey Edwards and Tony Schiavone of AEW Unrestricted signing off. <laughs>